So welcome everybody to today's webinar on demystifying funding and insolvency litigation. Uh, I'm Marcia Shekademian and I'm going to be chairing our session. Uh, the heavy lifting is going to be done by our three speakers and I'll take them in no particular order. Um, Jeff Carton Kelly, uh, he's a partner and director at FRP Advisory. He's a licensed insolvency practitioner with more than 35 years experience um, in contentious insolvency. Uh, second, we've got Alex J. He's a partner at Stewart's and he leads the contentious insolvency and asset recovery team there. And finally, uh, we have uh, Charles Jeffrey. He's director of litigation funding at Harbour Litigation. Uh, where he's been funding insolvency litigation in the UK and internationally uh, for many years. Um, now, first off, a few words about what we're planning to cover. Uh, this is going to be a practical session uh, following the likes life cycle of an insolvency claim from investigation through to the issue of proceedings and beyond. Uh, Jeff is going to kick off uh, uh, with a short talk uh, from the IP's perspective. He's going to look at the investigative process. He's going to look at engagement with creditors and the consideration of potential claims before he picks up the phone to someone like Alex. Uh, if Alex looks up, uh, still uses a phone, I don't suppose anybody does anymore. But let's stick with phones for now. Let's, uh, let's be 20th century about this. Uh, Alex is, is going to take up the baton He's going to look at issues like the assessment of merits, what further evidence might be needed. And then he's going to look at, well, how to fund a claim. And then, needless to say, he's going to pick up his phone or his virtual phone to Charles. And it'll be then Charles's job to talk us through the funding process from the perspective of the funder. He's going to talk about the options that are available, the mechanics, and the funder's relationship with the IP, with the lawyers, and indeed with the litigation itself. Uh, now, we're very keen that today should be uh, an exchange of views. We want it to be a dynamic uh, one, and we welcome your contributions uh, as we're going. So we'd encourage you to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens, um, not the chat button, uh, and ask questions throughout the sessions. Um, you can ask questions anonymously if you like, because there is that facility in the q and I'm going to field the questions and I'm going to make sure that only the really difficult ones get any airtime. But to kick off, we've got a poll. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, that will kick, pick, uh, show up on your screens. Uh, and we'd like to, you to answer this question. How many cases have you been involved with in the last three years that have had external funding? None, one to two, three to five, or more than five. Um, so before we get going with our talks, please uh, click the relevant box now. Thanks very much. So 30% of those of you um, who are attending haven't had a funded claim in, in the last uh, three years. And uh, one to two, three to five, pretty evenly spread, more than five, 16%. And it may be that when we come to our discussion, um, uh, our panelists will be able to say whether or not in their view, that's a surprising um, statistic. Anyway, that's quite enough from me. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Jeff. Thanks, Marcia, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as the IP rep on this panel, I'm going to have a quick canter through typical scenarios involving what we might describe as a, a nil asset case. That's to say, no readily available or uh, limited liquid assets. Um, where creditors who've lost money, be they lenders, investors, suppliers, government institutions, um, have asked us to get involved to look at the art of the possible, where no clear route to asset recovery or a claim has been identified, or perhaps where the creditor constituency uh, would rather you didn't use uh, existing funds to pursue claims. 
It also doubles as a campaign to the wider audience to consider engaging with IPs early in enforcement recovery scenarios or judgment enforcement uh, where loss has been suffered um, to enable the broadest range of, option, range of options to be considered and how best our powers can be deployed. Um, as a rule, we love cases like this um, where you have to use your nous and ingenuity, um, our bloodhound's nose, if you like, our skills as an alchemist um, or something of a, of a magician to conjure something from nothing. Finding and recovering assets and monetizing claims is our, is our aim. Cases without obvious or liquid assets are most likely to need funding. So where should the IP start in order to stand the best chance of a successful outcome? What, what assets or other recovery options might be available to me? Uh, have we got any leads, speculative or otherwise, from the um, organisations who are trying to get you involved? Who are the targets? Where are they based? Do they have the wherewithal to meet any claim I might want to bring? Um, is there, was there a DNO policy? Is there professional indemnity insurance cover? Are they fit to sue? Are we looking at a private company, a PLC, a bank, an individual or individuals? Depending on when you're first contacted, there may be some basic information available to you, but often little or none. Sometimes there's a massive amount of information, but um, as ever, it's good to retain your healthy scepticism as an IP about such information when doing your initial due diligence. I had a matter where the nominating creditor expensively and extensively researched completely the wrong but identically named family and their significant assets before proceeding. The correct target family had little or no assets. Not very helpful. Something of a cliche to say that the earlier we get involved, the better, but there's no doubt that engagement with your proposed IP as part of the enforcement process is likely to enhance the overall outcome. Indeed, using insolvency processes and the powers that accompany them to make recoveries are to be encouraged. Uh, not often, but more common now, we get asked right at the beginning if we would assist in determining the correct path to enforce a debt or a claim to get an entity or individual into an insolvency process, despite no obvious assets. And as a profession, we can help with sort of pre-action due diligence and explore the enforcement options too. If though the first you know about a case is pretty much when you're nominated to act, you'll be starting from scratch. Um, the theory is that we can use our powers to obtain information, data, documents, etc. Could turn to the court, although it would cost to enforce compliance. But the reality is that you'll encounter resistance to that at every term. How do you, how do you overcome that? Uh, a few firms like ours and many of those attending this webinar are prepared to speculate on cases like this because we're good at assessing risk. Uh, we've got an appetite for it. We know how to manage it. And we have a feel for uh, what's go worth going after. Initial due diligence on a possible case, even just using open source information and a bit of the aforementioned nous can often yield enough for you to take a view. Also, this set of IPs understands the consequences to them and their respective firms of taking such cases on and the difference between types of claim when it comes to adverse cost exposure and the ability to insure against this and more on that later from Alex and Charles, no doubt. Enthusiastic, committed, well-funded creditors who are prepared to back you financially are a rarity. So you'll need to bring the creditor constituency with you post appointment. Be prepared to debate with them the likely cost requirements of the options you've established to see if they've got an appetite to fund you, which is sadly very rare. So you're more likely to be considering a funding option and possibly taking on some risk yourself. Lawyers may already be on board, but even if that is the case, we will assess sometimes using external corporate intelligence investigators, what assets might be worth going after, or whether proceedings should be brought ahead of considering handing over to lawyers. How far would we usually go before thinking about legal advice? Um, in the event lawyers aren't already involved, we'd still engage early with our chosen firm. And if claims were looking likely, uh, start thinking about choice of counsel. Depending on the result of your initial investigations, you'd hope to be able to consider options within a month or so, but be prepared to encounter resistance to provide information from those who are, uh, under statutes at least, uh, obliged to provide it. Like many IPs, not all lawyers are comfortable working on a contingent basis, partial or otherwise, um, and even fewer counsels, so choose carefully. 
But if you are considering getting funding or assigning the claim, you'll have a longer list of law firms and counsel to use. The expansion of the litigation funding market in recent years has dramatically increased the prospects of successfully bringing claims as an IP and lessened the risk for us. Competition in that market has enabled a balance to be struck between risk and reward that has, for the most part, allowed the option of funding or assigning a claim to be considered much more frequently than in the past. Some funders are now offering seed funding for our initial investigative work, perhaps where you know a little bit more about the claim at the commencement of the case and specific work to assess value and recoverability would help. That's a helpful addition to the armory. More often than not, initial detailed investigations resulting in an options paper is perhaps the most likely outcome of the initial period of work, uh, the fees for which will be on risk. What sources do we use for this initial investigative work? Um, if you're appointed and there are records you can easily access, happy days, um, that would be a very good start. But often in these types of cases, records will be scarce, if not non-existent. And you'll be trying to piece together a jigsaw partially blindfolded and with one arm tied behind your back. For corporate targets, uh, info gathering, information gathering will depend on uh, the size of the target, the jurisdiction they're based in, what information you can glean from the claimant's own records. And if you've got evidence of funds or asset transfers, um, whether they're regulated or not, whether they're listed or not, LLP or limited company, uh, most of this work will be open source based, but uh, information from um, broker notes, research papers, regulatory filings, companies house, land registry, etc., cetera, um, will be a good start. The likelihood and extent of professional indemnity insurance cover would be useful for targets that are professional service firms or financial institutions. Not always easy to find, um, but sometimes they can be found in letters of engagement or other contractual documents between the parties. For targets who are individuals, um, banks would be an obvious place to start. They're usually pretty slow to respond. Accountants and lawyers, similarly slow to respond possibly likely in the lawyer's case to put up a privilege argument or deliberately delay, uh, as well as the other open source um, uh, options such as Companies House and Land Registry. Um, funnily enough, there are often more productive routes these days to look at um, the wherewithal of targets, including social media. It's astonishing um, how useful this can be on lifestyle, physical assets, um, relationships, associates, um, and incredible to see how keen people are to share information about other people without them knowing. That's been a great help in a number of our cases. Uh, airlines and the border agency can uh, post appointment anyway, help you with uh, people movement and uh, locations they might have been to in order to uh, link them to assets you might be in pursuit of. Uh, HMRC can be a good source in certain circumstances, but tread carefully because they will in what they can give you. Uh, it's very helpful if they are the only creditor. And um, don't underestimate the uh, pure gold uh, in the value of wronged spouses and family members. Hurdles put in our way might include recently created trust schemes, movements of uh, assets and jurisdictions, transfers to family members and sham divorces, which is quite common, diverted inheritances, etc. Once you've been through all of the processes I've just mentioned, um, reviewing that data set should be able to help you locate and identify potential claims and assets. You should be able to have seen movements between accounts and between connected parties and get you on your way to assessing wherewithal um, and uh, your target and start to inform you um, the next steps you're going to be taking. Can you identify a claim and the ability to monetize it? Tactically, uh, you don't want information you can't use in proceedings, so carefully consider the use of third party investigators, but um, I would say much of this initial work that I've outlined, you as the IP can and probably should do uh, internally. So now you might be ready to talk to lawyers about a possible case if you haven't already. Uh, you might want to look at further investigation, use of forensic techniques on data you've obtained, um, perhaps this is more important now than ever before, or start some asset tracing. Uh, each case is different, but now you're looking at being paid for your work to date and for the next stage of the investigative process ahead of issuing proceedings. 
there is a trend towards assignment of claims, although some recent case law might restrict the types of cases that can be assigned. But a claim will need legal assessment and almost certainly a positive counsel's opinion. And what do you need to do to get to that point? Uh, over to Alex. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, that was, you know, that was very helpful. And, you know, it's self-evident from the level of detail um, and approach that Jeff has talked about that in a case like that, I would anticipate being provided with a reasonable amount of information um, at, the, at the start of the case. And that's really important for me as a lawyer starting to look and being able to assess the feasibility of the case. Because I can tell you about the process that I adopt, which is not necessarily the right process, but it's the one I adopt having worked on, on, on numerous no asset cases or cases where for one reason or another, we go out into the market and seek funding. And I uh, adopt what I, what I term a four stage process. I will look at the initial feasibility. I'll look at the asset value of the defendants absolutely key as Jeff has talked about. I'll then look at the actual claim itself and there's a few points around that I'll, I'll talk to. And then last but by no means least at all is a detailed consideration of the commercial position so that we know before we go and approach a funder what the parameters are we might need to uh, address and look at. And those are the four phases and they, they go stage by stage. And I say that because you want to assess each stage and if a claim is not suitable, then you can have a discussion with the IP. Um, you know, you can invest an awful lot of time in claims and you need to work out at each stage whether it's one that's going to progress. So what I call the initial feasibility um, assessment, it does a little bit what it says on the tin. Um, you, I will have a look at the papers, I will look at what appears to be the claim in front of me and I will see whether I think there are any obvious showstoppers. You know, if matters date back a number of years, there might be a limitation issue, you might want to look at that. There might be an obvious fundamental issue um, with a particular point. I had one not all that long ago looking at the date on which a loan note uh, for limitation purposes began to run, which is a very unique, I suppose, and, and, and relatively quirky point, but the entire case turned on that. But you look at those obvious glaring points early on, because there's no point doing all of the work and then finding out that, well, actually, there's a fundamental problem you could have identified early on. Uh, another approach I sometimes apply uh, is what I call the white knight test. And this is born out of years and years of dealing with litigation funders, and many will apply a test of this nature. And really, it is as simple as understanding whether or not in bringing the claim, are we, are we viewed on a moral, forget the law, are we viewed on a moral basis as the good guys in this? Because if we are, that can often be helpful as the claim progresses, and if you're not, it doesn't mean you wouldn't run the claim, but it does mean you might want to think more closely, particularly when you come to claim evaluation stage. So I call it the white knight test. Um, in insolvency, obviously, we're more often the white knights than not because of the nature of our work. Um, but it is a, a valuable check I have found over the years. Um, the next big point on initial feasibility is claim size. If we are looking at investigating a claim that we are going to take and uh, put to funders, then you have to have a suitable claim size. Everyone is going to say, well, what is a suitable claim size? And that is, you know, a very uh, difficult question. Um, claims where you're seeking a funding budget of less than, you know, five million or so can be difficult. It doesn't mean they're impossible. If you have a very simple claim, perhaps for a lower value, then, then maybe you can make it work. But it's worth knowing what the claim value is early on. Sometimes that's not obvious. You know, I've had cases where we've not necessarily known what the full claim value would be, but you can make an assessment based on the value of the actual underlying creditor claims. You know, I've had a case very recently where we suspect that underlying creditors are very, very significant, but actually only a relatively small number in the low millions had actually submitted proofs of debt, and there was a question of why. So the first piece of work we did on that case before we did anything else was 
undertaking a process to try and understand what the full scope of creditor claims could be. And you find that particularly in investor fraud cases where you might have a, a wide group of investors who, who've lost money and uh, they've lost it through a, through a corporate scheme of one sort or another. Um, so those are the initial feasibility parameters that I certainly um, look to engage. And assuming that I do so and, and that passes muster, I go on to the next phase, and Jeff has talked a little bit about this um, already in his um, uh, in his section. But, but I will add that add to that a little, particularly on, on some legal points to bear in mind. And it goes down to the asset value of defendants um, in in insolvency cases where we are looking to recover assets into the estate for the benefit of the creditors. You can have a claim value of as much as you like, but ultimately, if your defendants aren't going ever to be able to meet the value of that claim, then that is, is not the most relevant factor. What is most relevant is what you can recover. And there are some different parameters to look at around that. And having realistic expectations around realizable asset values, to me, is, is absolutely fundamental. So, for example, if you're looking at defendants, and Jeff has done lots of very good work, you know, undertaking reviews such as he can, open source material, identifying targets and assets, and we're presented with a suite of individuals, for example, who own property. You know, that is great, but my experience is that property has a law of, uh, can have a law of diminishing returns. You know, even if you know the value of a property and you have an idea of what the mortgage lending, for example, might be on it and you know the equity. You can often have cases where the value, the realizable value you get back at the end of a case, particularly if it goes on for a long time, can often be less. And of course, you've got costs of realizing the property, costs of sale. I had a case where we had a, a, a fairly valuable property, over half a million, no encumbrances on it at all. So you're thinking that's a good target. But we had a real battle getting control of it for various reasons. And by the time we did get control of it, it had been overtaken by squatters who had used it as some sort of deer hunting lodge. And there was, I kid you not, a deer uh, hanging up in the house um, that had been caught. And I, I raised the point because it affected the value of the property fairly significantly. You know, we lost about £150,000 of value on that particular case. So that is a factor. Jeff talked about directors. They might have DNO cover. You have to be careful about insurance cover. Um, it is always, as a, as a side point, worth looking at what insurance policies might be available to meet any damages or liability claims you might want to bring on behalf of a company particularly. You can try to understand the level of the DNA policy, but also think about what exclusions might exist. You know, if you're bringing what is in effect a fraud claim, is a DNA policy going to meet that claim? Maybe not. Um, it's something that you might want to think about in terms of assessing value. Professional and institutional defendants um, typically will have a greater, on paper at least, value. Jeff has alluded to that um, already. And they can, you know, they are, they are often brought in as respondents to claims for various reasons. But do have a think about whether or not those entities might have minimum insurance requirements. You know, some professional bodies have minimum requirements. Do also think about whether they might have liability caps. If you are looking at bringing in effect a, a negligence claim against a, a, a former advisor to the company, will they have a liability cap? You know, even if you have a very sizable um, uh, institution, if it's limited its liability, then you might find that that is a problem um, for your case going forward. Um, financial institutions, you often see, Jeff alluded to that, um, they facilitate money flows and so often they're brought in. It's you know, very worthwhile considering those and of course considering the uh, various duties that are imposed on them um, as part of their role, particularly where they're regulated. You know, you can have quince care duties and similar types of issue that feed into your assessment of the merits when you get there. The location of your defendants, of course, is very important to consider as well. Are they in jurisdictions where, realistically, you think you would be able to enforce against them? And it's important to have that assessment anyway when you come to look at the commercial position, as I'll come on to later, 
because that is going to have a cost implication. And if you have to enforce overseas or indeed bring proceedings overseas, then you're going to have to look at the type of advice that you would need from lawyers to help you achieve that. It might be that there's a process of engagement between me and Jeff at this point as well, in terms of more information from Jeff, what else can we find? Um, we might also want to appoint external investigators, either to locate assets or possibly to locate information. Um, we do that fairly frequently at Stuart. So I'm actually on the right case, we would fund or part fund, depending on the um, situation, an external investigator if it was felt that that was going to be a suitable route to unlock a valuable claim. So it's something that's worth bearing in mind. Once I've got past this phase, and I'm happy that I have a feasible on the face of it claim and I have defendants who are likely to have the sort of asset value that could meet any damages I'm, I might seek. For me, it's only at this stage I would begin to look at the actual merits of the claim. Now, some people might look at the commercial position here first. They might start to think about costs and, and funding limits and, uh, and what you would need. Personally, I look at evaluation of the claim next because I think that feeds in too much to the commercial position. You have to understand, you have to do the work on the claim to understand the issues you're going to have to explore, the complexity and therefore the budget that you are going to need ultimately to bring the claim. So I turn to evaluating the claim now. And every claim is, is different. There are some themes, particularly in insolvency litigation cases that tend to appear regularly, but every case is different. For me, an important part of the approach is to set uh, and, and agree and have an understanding of what sort of budget you are going to spend looking at a claim in this early phase. And it's a useful exercise so that you don't just have a, an, an open-ended and unlimited back and forth process. And we at, at Stuart certainly, we, we, will, we, will, we will allocate a budget and we will go through a process to assess what we think we need to invest in order to unlock this claim. And that might be many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds, depending on the claim. But we'll do that so we know what we are getting into and we are happy to commit the resources of our team to explore the claim. And it is really important that you have a team that is prepared to do that and prepared to commit the necessary resources with the necessary expertise, because all of this process is an investment, as I say, designed to unlock claims. And if you are not prepared to commit fully to that process early on, then you, you, will, you will run into difficulties in terms of getting to a point where you have a suitable evaluation of your claim and you've undertaken a suitable assessment of the merits and the issues you're going to have to explore. Um, it, it's just really important to do, and that is why we certainly do it in the way I've described. Um, there are some things that can factor into this early on. Uh, seed investment at an early stage. We, in some cases, you might consider going and talking to the funders at this point in time and explaining where you are and explaining that you need some investment at this point to deal with particular issues and you'd like them to, in effect, uh, share some of the risk uh, of doing so with you early on. And that's something I'm sure that um, Charles will be able to, to talk about. It's worth bearing in mind, it's not suitable for every case. The other thing to consider once you've gone through your assessment of the claim process is whether or not you get counsel's opinion at this stage. And it can depend a little bit on the case. For me personally, once you have undertaken the claim review and once you've looked at the commercial position, as I'll come on to um, reasonably quickly, it's often a good idea to start engaging with the funder, in my experience, around this time. Um, you can engage with the funder, you can get their initial views, you would have scoped out the claim in enough um, detail in order to understand whether or not the funder is interested. And at that point, of course, if you approach counsel with a funder, uh, then it is easier uh, and often more uh, suitable to 
look to get opinions on merits so that you can move forward. The final part of my assessment phase, once I've done the parts I've described already, and I'm, I'm happy at each stage that it's worth continuing, is looking at the commercial position. And this is obviously essential in all cases. We have to have enough uh, headroom in a case so that there is enough money to pay the various stakeholders and of course leave some for creditors. You know, this has to be ultimately a process designed to benefit the creditors or again, you'll run into issues. So to do that, there are various component parts. You need to understand what the legal costs you think will be to run your case. You need to understand the adverse costs. What is the level of um, ATE cover that you'll need? So you can start to assess what the cost of that will be. You can start to assess what the up, what upfront premium you might need. And if you have no money and you have to fund an upfront premium, that is a discussion you will need to have with the funder. So that again is an important point to bear in mind. We actually have a, a permanent team of in-house cost draftsmen to help us with this exercise because it's so fundamental, uh, we think, at Stewart's to be able to make those assessments so that you don't run into trouble later on in your case. There is nothing worse than being halfway through a case and either running out of funding or finding that you need to up your ATE budget. It does happen for very legitimate reasons, but if you can avoid it, it is clearly preferable. So that is the next phase that I uh, typically look to undertake. Now, if having done that and having prepared my thoughts on the claim and the commercials, and I feel I have an idea of what I'm going to be asking Charles to uh, look at, um, that is when I would get to the point of having some serious discussions as to whether or not there is interest in funding it and we can start to look at the roadmap to get that funded. There's one other point I'll just talk about very quickly before I pass on to Charles, and that is the point about IP's duties in looking at claims. Um, there is a duty, of course, in terms of structuring a claim to make sure that it is structured in a way that is delivering value for creditors. Uh, there is also a duty, of course, to make sure that the terms of any external financing, be that funding, be that ATE, are also uh, suitable. And that's something that, that is worth considering and do, you know, you need to speak to your legal team about that to make sure that is all being, being done uh, sensibly. You know, there are some issues as well that have arisen. Um, in recent cases, there are cases determining that claims are assets of the estate. You know, that has come up, particularly in cases over assignments being challenged, LF2 v Substone was, was one. So they are, you know, they are, they are assets of the estate and need to be treated as, as such. Um, there can be issues as well, of course, if claims are not pursued, then, you know, that needs to be thought about fairly carefully. There can be very good reasons for not pursuing them, but it can also lead to disgruntled creditors trying to create issues. You know, that happened in a recent case, uh, the Rhino Enterprises case. Um, that happened where a claim was not pursued on advice, and then the creditors went rallied around, got an opinion, and said you should have pursued it. Uh, so it's a difficult position that, but it's one to be to be mindful of. And if you're not going to pursue a claim, as Jeff has alluded to, then you might want to think about assignment. That is a separate topic with its own pros and cons. So I'll say no more. But those are certainly points that you know the legal team and the IPs will want to be discussing. Um, that was a fair canter through, but I'll pass on over my now to Charles. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, I think the a, a good place to start would actually be where Jeff mentioned, and that is you know, the cliche of the earlier we can get involved, the better. And you know, when we come to discussions around seed funding, I think the easiest way to describe it is, is a bit of a, a drag and sting style pitch. Um, now. You know, as funders, we don't sit in a reclined chair with a, a lot of cash next to us. Um, but the concept is, is very similar. You, know, you are presenting an idea to us. Uh, you have potentially identified a claim. Um, you know, you've you conducted the sniff test and, and it, smells, it smells dodgy. And there is, there is no smoke without fire. But in order to develop the claim further, that could be to deal with a preliminary hearing. It could be for go to council, it could be for forensics or asset tracing, you know, there is a, an investment that is required 
to, to get to that stage. And we at Harbour, uh, anyway, are happy to have seed funding discussions. We've seed funded in the past. Uh, we have numerous matters on at the moment where we're discussing, discussing seed funding. And in terms of you know, what it is we need to see, um, it's very much understanding you know, what is the end goal? You know, what are you asking for? What will this seed funding get us to? What will it provide? And if we can get a clear understanding that you know, in, in order to get to a point where the case is ready to be fully fat funded, uh, as we're kind of all used to, it needs to have that initial work. So we will want to get an understanding of what it is we're looking to do, what the money will be spent on, and, and as I say, ultimately, you know, what is that end goal? Now, in seed funding examples that we've had in the past, it's very good to get an understanding of the risk sharing element. You know, if the office holder and the lawyer are saying, you know, we want to be paid uh, hourly rates in full, it's, it's quite a hard discussion because everybody I think should be equally incentivized when it comes to seed funding. Everybody should be willing to have a bit of skin in the game uh, and, and want to get to a particular stage where we can then proceed with the claim. So everything is, is obviously viewed on, on a case by case basis. You know, I don't think there's gonna be many funders that will start pumping in millions in, into seed funding. It'll generally be a set amount that will be capped uh, and agreed, and it could be staggered in certain phases. So for example, uh, I've had one quite recently where the first phase of funding is to deal with a preliminary hearing uh, around limitation. If we can get past that, then you know, that's the first hurdle overcome, and then we can start further discussions on, on funding and, and proceeding with the claim. And in order to proceed you know, with the claim, you know, once we're at that kind of ready stage, very much echo what Jeff and Alex have said in terms of, of their shopping list. You know, the number one thing for us is, is recoverability and enforcement. You know, where is the money? How are we all going to get paid at the end of it? Because there's no point in all of us putting lots of time and money on the clock if we get to a stage where you know, we're not going to get paid. It's simply not worth it. So we will want to have an understanding nice and early. It is our primary goal to understand where is the money and how do we get to it? Uh, and if it means that a, a bit of money has to be spent in order to go and get a report or whatever it may be, you know, we're happy to, to stump up that cash, but we can't proceed anywhere uh, without knowing that information. And at which point, if we can get satisfied on the recovery element, we would then start to look at the economics. And funding has, has changed quite a bit recently. I don't know whether it's maybe due to the COVID pandemic and just times in general, but what we're seeing a lot of now is, is not just funding, you know, Alex's costs and council, it's actually also to, to fund Jeff and, and the IP's costs. We, we firmly believe that, you know, IP's, you know, they're, they're not a charity, you know, they should be paid along the way. And if, if they, want to be paid and you know they, they share their budget uh, and providing it, it works within within the numbers then then we're happy to pay that a, a lot of ips and, and lawyers that we're seeing at the moment is is a good risk sharing element um and it's a case of you know we need to keep the lights on we've got wages to pay uh, and we would quite like to get into some kind of hybrid arrangement whether that be a 50 50 deal and we get half our rates paid and we're happy to carry the rest over on on risk you know, that works really well for us now our investment committee in particular takes a lot of comfort in that that, that everybody again is is equally incentivized in, in bringing a claim forward i'm going to have to interrupt you there uh, charles um i have a question from gary pettit uh, with the courts pressing adr what involvement would a funder require in the decision making under say a mediation so we we as a, as a funder you know we have very little to no control of a, of a case. So when it comes to things like settlement discussions uh, and ADR, there's, there's not a lot we can do. You know, we expect there to be a, a, a bit of common sense involved. You know, everybody needs to understand that everybody is, is still going to get paid and the creditors are still going to be substantially better off, but we, we'd like to be kept up to date and informed regularly of, of any discussions that are taking place. But as I say, it's, it's not our decision as to what, what happens and what takes place. Thank you. 
Uh, and then back to the economics, it's then a case of, of discussing ATE. Uh, we at Harbour, we, we obviously we have our own ATE uh, company. Uh, so we, we can go to them. Uh, likewise, we can also go out to market to ensure that we're getting the best deal. And, and we'll factor in all of those numbers, at which point it effectively it all goes into a spreadsheet, it all gets modelled out, and then we can look at what return the creditors are, are likely to get. Because I think that, that is again, equally as important. If the creditors are getting less than 50% of the damages, it's, it's not something that we are going to proceed with. It's just, it, it's not commercially right. And as Alex said, is, are you acting as the white knight? If we are all getting paid and, and the creditors are, are, are not equally as incentivized. Uh, and then only at that point, really, will we then actually start to look at, at the merits of the claim. Um, when we're provided with the details of a case, it's generally a, a memo provided by the lawyer with the DRP's input. If you have already been to counsel, then that's great, that, that's helpful. If not, then it's something that we would seek to do ourselves. We, we don't necessarily require counsel to provide a, a number in terms of percentage of success. We would much rather see uh, you know, where is the case strong, where is it weak, and of those weaknesses, how can we overcome those? Uh, percentage to us isn't, isn't overly important. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, we'd be very keen to discuss with Jeff his engagement with the creditors. Has he spoken to them regarding funding? Has he informed them that of the potential costs uh, of the process and how it works? You would be amazed at how often we are sent cases and we go through lots of hoops, lots of hurdles, uh, a, a huge amount of time is put in and the creditors turn around and say, no, we don't like the thought of that. Uh, we're giving up, we, we, we're not prepared to give up any, any cash as a result. And you know, it, it's all well and good back, going back to the creditors and saying, well, it, you pay for it then. Um, and, and often they, they, they change their mind, but we, we very much want to understand who the creditors are uh, and what is your engagement with them. Finally, if, if, if we're satisfied with all of, all of the above, uh, we will then go into our kind of formal review process. This takes a, a handful of weeks. Um, we may have to go external for advice, uh, but ultimately we will present the case to our investment committee. Fingers crossed we can get a, the, the, the thumbs up and a green stamp. And then it's a case of going back to Jeff and to Alex with, with an offer. Um, typically, there's normally going to be two or three offers that are put forward. And it's just no duty to speak to the creditors to say, look, this is how the deals have been presented. I want to pick this one for, for this particular reason. Uh, if, if we are successful and, and we are the chosen funder, it then goes into our case management team. Uh, and, and going back to uh, Gary's question, you know, we, we don't have any control of, of the case. What we like is uh, when you, you send your invoice across, uh, we, we want an update just to let us know what's going on. Even if it's, a, if it's a case of popping on an email, nothing, nothing has changed. Um, at least for us, it's, it's nice to know. Uh, and, and ultimately, that's the best way to get your invoice paid is by providing a, a, decent, uh, a, de a decent update. So that, that's, for us, is generally the life cycle of the claim. You know, what we're asked frequently is, is how, how do I pick a funder? How do I decide which funder to go to? Because in, in truth, we all do the same thing. We all pay bills. Um, it, it's, it's not as exciting as, as people think when you're trying to describe it. It's, we pay bills and, and we sell money for a living. So the questions you should be asking the funder is, do you have experience in this particular jurisdiction? Whether it be offshore or Hong Kong, uh, Australia, the US, um, but a lot of what we see is here in the UK. Uh, and also, you know, do you have good experience in this, in this field? Some funders specialise in, in insolvency, some specialise in class actions. You know, it's, it's understanding, are, are you picking the right funder for the job? Next, that you should be asking is, you know, what is the, the source of funds? You know, do they have the resources to, to, to fund a particular action all the way? Um, you, know, you don't want to be in a stage where you're getting halfway through a claim uh, and the funder phones and says, uh, we're, we're terribly sorry, we, we've ran out of money. And, and we have unfortunately seen some horror stories here at Harbour where office holders have come to us because their funder has run out of money. Uh, and in that particular instance, you know, they were leveraging their investments. They needed case one to finish in order to fund case four. So you want to you know, really do your due diligence on, on who you're working with and ensuring that they can back you all the way. Uh, and finally, 
you know, once you once you've got all the, the quotes from the funders that you need, typically I think most IPs and upholders will will go and get three quotes. Uh, it's just to remember that you know, the cheapest isn't always the best option. You know, if, if it is substantially cheaper than than the other funders, it's because of finding out why it's cheaper is there a particular reason, uh, and you know, you will have to demonstrate that to the creditors as to why you're picking the deal you are. And creditors are always going to be in favour. I think of the cheaper option because it means they're going to get a higher return. But it's, it's, it's your duty to, to explain to them why you're picking the particular deal you're picking. And I think uh, with, with that, Marcy, I'll, uh, I'll hand back to you. Um, thank you very much, um, Charles. Um, we've, we've had, well, uh, Stephen Coupling calls it more a statement than a question, but, but, but um, his, his statement actually picks up on a question that I was going to ask of um, Alex and of you. Uh, Alex said um, in the course of his talk that it's difficult or, or not, not commercially feasible to get a claim funded where the claim is worth less than five million pounds. And that um, is a very, um, it's a very common perception uh, in the market um, or, or, or the market being the users being being creditors uh, and certainly being us at the bar, uh, which is that it's not possible to get funding for a low value claim. And as, as, as we know, and as Stephen has said, his business does fund low value claims. Um, would you agree with what uh, Alex has said about uh, the feasibility and the viability of, of uh, funding anything that's worth less than five million pounds? Think, as, a, as a statement of general application. I think Stephen is right in, in what he said. You know, there are smaller claims that can be funded. It's very much a, a case of the economics. You know, I've looked at some claims that are you know, nearly 20 million, but because of the, the high budgets that are involved, that they're not economically viable to run. Whereas if there is a, a claim, for example, that is 5 million, but it has a particularly small budget, then then they, they can be made to work. You know, certain funders have certain criteria. Um, in Manor, for example, we know that they do a lot of the smaller claims. They're, they're very good at dealing with that. And this is where you know, the assignment model can come in. The assignment does often favor smaller claims. So there, there are particular routes that, that, that you can deal with. Um, but, uh, but I would say that you know, claims of any size can be funded, but it's very, very much dependent on the numbers involved. Marcio, I should probably say as well, my, my point was, in my experience, if you don't have a fairly substantial, and I used five million as a generic yardstick rather than a sort of hard, you know, rule of, you know, a, a hard and fast rule. And I think it can be difficult. That's not to say it's not possible. You know, Stephen's quite right. You know, there can be, a, there can be options to get uh, cases funded. Um, my experience is with the level of work required to get a case to funding, then it's something that we at Stuarts would certainly think very carefully about if we were asked to do that for a claim in the initial feasibility sniff test claim value size that was, you know, starting to get a lot lower than as a yardstick for me. But please don't treat that as a hard and fast rule. And, you know, Stephen is quite right in what he says. Thanks. Thanks both. Um, we now have a question from Nick Oliver that starts high all, so I'll throw that to the floor. How much work on modelling of outcomes based on different funding options, creditor funding, solicitors on a full slash part CFA with ATE, DBA, different third party litigation funding offers, including outright sale of the claim? Do you think it is now necessary before selecting which option to take? particularly given the recent changes to SIP9? Shall I, shall Jeff, I take Jeff, that? what are the recent to... changes to <laughs> SIP9? <laughs> uh, well, enough to have us thinking about, um, well, paying more attention to the selection of these uh, of, of this type of disbursement, i.e. the, the, the um, dilution of funds that might come back to creditors. I think um, uh, Nick's question is a, is a, is a good one. And uh, as the sort of, uh, I suppose the only accountant on the panel as well. Um, we love a bit of a spreadsheet. Um, and, you know, you're going to be thinking very carefully in, in, the, in the way you're conducting your case um, 
about how everybody ends up in this uh, scenario. Um, and certainly when you, once you're plugging in the various criteria that you're being offered by the funders that you're making comparisons uh, about, um, clearly that will have all of those sort of factors um, involved and the metrics can be very different. Um, I think Charles just mentioned a case where a, a 20 million claim couldn't be funded because the costs of getting to, to that or the, the, uh, the likely costs of the um, uh, either the investigation work or the forensic work or whatever would, would actually not work in terms of their metrics. Um, same thing really has got to happen in relation to the outcome for creditors and, and it, is, it is the duty of the IP to have reviewed all of those various options. I think um, one of my early comments was about that sort of engagement with creditor group. I think it becomes fairly obvious fairly quickly whether you've got um, a creditor constituency who's very keen to you know, literally go to the ends of the earth to, to bring the claim because they feel very strongly about it and they have the funds that enable them to do that. Um, financial institutions might be a um, certainly a, a good source of um, uh, potential cash for those sorts of things. But more often than not, particularly in things like investment scams where you've got a lot of uh, individuals, you know, that's just not really practical. The sort of crowdfunding idea is, is really not very practical. Um, but certainly, if you if you can, I've had a case where I haven't been able to go out to everybody in the, in the marketplace because of confidentiality reasons, for instance. But in most cases, you're going to be able to um, pick and choose uh, at least three it would be the right thing to do, at least in terms of your your duties and obligations uh, to make the comparatives. Look at the other options available. Look at a claims purchase option, depending on the size of claim. Look at the percentages being offered for. Um, what you might get out of the proceeds, match that up against what you might need to put out of the door for uh, if, you, if ATE is not included within the funding package, um, you know, what, what premiums might you be able to, might you have to pay out uh, in order to get the cover you need. Uh, and spreadsheets, I'm afraid, are probably the best way of doing, of doing that uh, and present that to your, uh, your, your creditor, either if you've got a creditor committee or your, um, your creditor reps, um, in order to comply with, yeah, sort of uh, the, your SIP9 obligations. Thanks, thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, actually, picking up on that, uh, we've had an interesting question from Stephen Hunt. Um, I, 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 he says uh, this, following Nick's point, ought the IP to be selecting lawyers on the basis that they will accept both funded and CFA arrangements? Otherwise, you don't have a choice once the case is moving forward. I suppose one observation I'd have on that is that cases can change during, during the life cycle. And if you have a team um, as a whole that isn't prepared to work as a team and to work flexibly at all, then, then that could be a problem. So I think it's a valid point that Steve raises. I mean, it's certainly one to consider. It feeds a little bit back into you know, the modelling point in terms of what you do in terms of your assessment of what... Um, what structure are you going to put in place to support the claim? And that includes lawyers on CFAs, DBAs, funding ATE. Do you, can you, can you make a case cheaper by having an own side WIP insurance policy um, that is then funded as a premium that's lower than having funding to pay your fees? You know, all of those things do factor in. And I think the short answer is you do have to consider them very carefully. You know, putting, it is a team effort bringing a case on a, in my opinion it is, a team effort bringing a case involving a funder. You have a funder, you have in this case an IP client and you have a legal team and barristers as well. And everyone will need to pull in the right direction uh, to make that happen. So, so I think it is a, an important consideration and one to bear in mind, you know, to follow up on Steve's point. Thank you, Alex. Um, I had a question in from Laura Tudor, which I think is one for Charles. Is there a transparent, oh, let me just click on it so you can all see. Is there a transparent uh, limited criteria for funding before discussions begin? Or would funding be on a case-by-case -case basis? Uh, I, I think all, all funding is on a case-by-case -case basis, but there are general rules of thumb, which I think all funders tend to adhere to. Uh, and that the primary one is, is recoverability. You know, have we got clear evidence of, of, of assets that we can go after. 
and the next is, is the economics. I think most funders will tend to work on a on a 10 to 1 ratio, so 10 million pound claim, you would assume there's going to be a 1 million pound budget. Uh, if, if either of those don't stack up, you, or you can't provide comfort on either of those, then I think it's very unlikely that the case is going to get funded. Um, but, but your economics and recoverability are your two go-to standard procedures. Thank you, Charles. Um, and Edward Starling has just asked, and I think this is a question for Jeff. In the case of a £20 million case that could not be funded due to the level of the cost budget, given their duties, would you expect the IT to perhaps seek a second opinion on the choice of legal team with perhaps a lower cost model? Uh, hi, Ed. Yeah, I mean, I mean the short answer is yes. Um, and that obviously can be quite difficult, um, but you know when there is a claim of that size knocking about, um, it, it certainly is something you should you should be considering. It may well be that it's more attractive to go down an assignment route or a sale, a sale of the claim um, at, at that level. I don't think you want to get rid of a claim of that nature without having done more work on 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 that front. Um, I think it's an interesting one in the sense that. In the way that perhaps you might have done what we were talking about by choosing a litigation funder where you might go out to three say for comparative offers you probably don't um at, when you're choosing your lawyer um at the beginning of the, of the case i.e where you think you've got a claim and you're taking it to your lawyer and alex is doing say his assessment um process um you probably wouldn't sit there uh, when they come back and say, well, this is roughly how much it's going to be, you perhaps don't always then think, ah, oh, well, perhaps I should have put it out to three firms. I'm not aware of anybody who might do that. So it would be quite difficult, but I think you're probably right that you've probably got a duty to consider all alternatives. That makes sense to me. Um, we've got time for one more question. Um, and... Uh, it's a good one to finish with, and it's for all of you, and it's from Kevin Lucas. Assuming the parties, the IP, lawyer, counsel, are happy to work on a CFA, do you believe there needs to be a clear change in policy or the law to avoid the need for funding? I'm not quite sure why he's put it in inverted commas, but he has. Uh, when this is often driven by a need to avoid adverse costs and or offer security for costs. I think I can start with that one. Um, you know, if, if you have the option to avoid funding, then then you should take it. You know, funding is an expensive route. Uh, we can't make any secrets of that. Um, and, and quite often, a funder is brought in on purely on the basis that there is a security for cost element. And you know, if you, you are as, as a company in liquidation, you know, you haven't got any money. It's going to be a primary defense that the, the other side is going to use. And, and quite often the funder is there to, to dismiss that element. So if there can be changes in, in, in policy and the law to, to avoid that route, then of course yeah, they should be considered. I suppose I could add to that in a couple of ways. Um, I, I can. Com we've all seen the scenario where a common defense tactic will be to make a case very expensive and to make it commercially unattractive and unviable to run. And that can be candidly unfair. Um, I mean, there are mechanisms already um, that obviously allow a court to refuse an application for security for costs if it's going to uh, create a, a real probability of a stifling of a claim. And there have been relatively recent cases where IPs have, um, have had that argument rather than simply buying a deed of indemnity um, to avoid a security for cost position. So, so you do have that. I suppose looking at the other way though, the rules are, are never going to change, well, I, I don't think so, in terms of the losing party in litigation the English courts pays. So you would still have a scenario where uh, as an IP, you'd want to make sure you're fully protected. And you may run back into the same problems of needing ATE and possibly needing funding in order to do that. There is an interesting point around case management on, on, on this sort of issue and making sure if you're outside of a cost budgeting regime that the other side have to comply with cost budgeting anyway. So you know the level of your adverse cost exposure at all times and can, can, can um, make sure that your policy is suitable to meet it. 
Um, but but it is, it's a really good question. It raises a very interesting point that we could probably spend a long time talking about. Um, well, on that note, I suppose it's perhaps uh, appropriate uh, that we have in fact run out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for attending um, this webinar. Uh, I think we had about 160 of you online. Uh, thank you very much also to uh, Alex, Jeff and Charles. Um, the recording of this webinar will be available to view on Wilberforce's YouTube channel later this week in case you missed uh, any of the sessions. Uh, to find our channel, just type Wilberforce Chambers into the YouTube search bar. Uh, thanks again for coming and uh, I hope you all enjoy uh, the rest of your afternoon. Bye bye.